uh, we have been on this journey through the book of Ephesians uh, really for the past couple years. And what we'll do is we'll preach through a chapter or even a chunk of verses, and then maybe we'll step out and do a little something that's different, like a character study or diving deep into a specific topic of the Bible. But we're back in our study through Ephesians, and we're picking it up where we left off in Ephesians chapter 4. And we've titled this specific section of the Bible, On Off, On Off. If I could boil down what the Apostle Paul is trying to get across to all of us here through this letter, Ephesians, specifically in chapter 4, I would boil it down to two words. We're called to put off the, the old self and put on the new self. And the new self is not just a better, cool you. The new self is Christ in you, through you, all around you. The old self has gone in the grave, and the new self is Christ. And Paul's reminding the Ephesians of what that means, what that looks like. And that's what we're talking about in this on-off series. So I think we can learn much from it as well. We're going to go ahead and just, just briefly read the verses that we covered last week. If you want to hear a message on those verses, just go to walkchurch.com or visit our Walk Church app, and you can look at those sermons right there. And then we'll jump into our verses today. If you're ready, say ready. ready. If you're hungry, say let's eat. Let's eat. Let's eat. Let's eat from the word today. Father, speak to us now as we open your word. Uh, God, we need to hear a word from you, and we believe you'll do it. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, the scripture says that now this I say, verse 17, Ephesians 4, now this I say and testify in the Lord that you must no longer walk as Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Verse 18 says they are darkened in their understanding, alienated, which means separated, isolated from the life of God because of their ignorance in them, Due to their hardness of heart. It says they have become callous. They have given themselves up to sensuality. Greedy to practice every kind of impurity. But that is not the way you learned Christ. I should have read it a little bit louder with the exclamation point. Paul is trying to get this message across. He's saying that's not how I taught you. That's not how you received and learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. Would you just say that with me really quick? The truth is in Jesus. It's true. To put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, verse 23, to be renewed in the spirit of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. The word of the Lord. We're looking at verses 20 through 22 more specifically. We, we covered 17 through, through part of 20 last week, and that's where we'll jump right in. Verse 20 says it like this, but that is not the way you learned Christ. Now, originally when I was reading through this text, I read it and kind of kept on going. Like there's not a ton to really dig into and, and talk about it, but I felt like the Lord wouldn't let me pivot from this first part of verse 20 uh, because there was more in there to ring out. I want you to picture this kind of like a, a wet rag full of scripture and gems and diamonds and, and beauty from anointing from God. Let's, come on, let's ring every part of it out, amen? We want to get as much out of these verses as we can because all of them are inspired and good for us. In 20, Paul says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, he says, that's not the way you learned Christ, He's basically saying that, that Christianity is less of a religious way of living. It's more of a, a, a school. And what he's saying here is this. On, on the journey of, of the school of Christianity, he says that you didn't learn a, a religion, though not all religion is bad, right? Even James says that good and right religion is to love on widows and give to the poor and, and love Jesus in his book, right? Not all religion's bad, but Paul doesn't say that's not how you learned a religion. He doesn't say that that's how you learned history, though not all history in itself is bad. He said that's not how you learned philosophy, though not all philosophy in itself is bad. He says that's not how you learned science. That's not what he said, though not all science is bad. He didn't say that's how you learned algebra, though I would say all algebra is bad. Amen. Come on, right? <laughs> <laughs> I can't find anything good in there. Some of my math teachers, forgive me. No, no, no offense. 
It's my own personal struggle. I'm growing, right? He says they didn't learn facts. They didn't learn stats. That They didn't learn wisdom and information about a person. He says that's not how you learn. You actually learned a person. Here's what I want you to see here. It doesn't say, well, that's not the way you learned about Jesus. Because sometimes we can be tempted to think, what I need to do is I just need to puff up my brain with enough information about Jesus, then I'll feel more holy. But that's not the way you learned Christ. So what should that teach us? That Christianity is separate from everything else because it's not about how much you know, it's about the person you know. He says, that's not the way you learned Christ. And we're talking about an actual person we're learning here today. Dr. Peter O'Brien wrote a commentary in the book of Ephesians. He says, the phrase, to learn a person, appears nowhere else in the Bible and to date has not been traced anywhere else in pre-biblical Greek documents. He says, this is a phrase in Ephesians 4.20 that is unlike any other phrases in all of Scripture. He says, that's not the way you learned Christ. There's something special and different about this verse. This learning is different. Tony Marita says in his commentary on Ephesians, he says, this education is, is not a formal education, but transformational education, amen? He says, the first thing to note about this education is that Christ is the subject of the teaching. When you became a Christian, you do not merely learn about the teaching of Jesus, you develop a relationship with him. Paul said, somewhere along the lines, Ephesians, and maybe this would be helpful for Walk Church as well. Somewhere along the lines, you deviated from the relational personhood of Jesus, and you started thinking that this was more about do's and don'ts and check boxes and rights and wrongs. I got to do this. I got to go to church. I got to go to a group. I got to tithe. He, he said, that's not how you learned Christ, because when you, it was just you and Christ, you were good. Some, somewhere along the lines, you kind of started to drift from the actual person of Christ, and you kind of fell into the trap of just learning about Christ, and the thing that's so amazing about Christ is that he's relational. He's alive now. Amen. Like, amen, great. If two people clap, we all clap. Right? Like, we, we, we've started moving away from singing songs that say, like, come, Lord Jesus, because he's already here. Amen. Like, amen. he's like, Jesus, like, I'm here. Like, we're, I didn't go anywhere. You guys went somewhere. Like, Jesus, like, I was here before you got here. I've, I'm, I've been here. I've been waiting for you to come. So you can learn me, so you can experience me, so you can get to know me. Jesus is a real person who we're called to get to know. One of the scariest scriptures in the Bible, it's actually the verse that God used to save my life when I was a college student. In Matthew 7, 23, Jesus looks at a group of people who says, Lord, Lord, I did this for you. I did that for you. I did this for you. I prophesied for you. I, I cast out demons for you. I did miracles for you. And you know what Jesus says? He says, but I never knew you. And what he's saying there is, look, I'm not looking for you to do something for me. I'm looking for a relationship with you. I don't need it, like, right? Amen? Jesus says, I don't need anybody to do a bunch of good stuff for me. I, I, I created you so you could have a relationship with me. Right? Jesus doesn't need a relationship with us. We need a relationship with him. Amen? That's the truth. That's, that's the truth. That's the big facts of this text. Paul says that's not how you learned Christ, right? So I, I just want to be clear. Reading the Bible is not wrong. In fact, we need to read the Bible because we get to know Christ through it. But we shouldn't read informationally as if it were a textbook. We should read relationally as if God is speaking directly to us. And we need to get to know him, not just know about him. Some of you guys know that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a basketball player at heart. That's my, that's my story. I've been a Michael Jordan shoe collector since uh, I was in kindergarten. It's just my, my, my struggle, all right? And we got, we got a little Jordan sign here. And, and these shoes right here, if you'll allow me just to take this shoe off, right? This is, uh, they, don't, they don't smell bad, I promise you. I've got some new socks on. Um, but this shoe right here is one of my favorite Jordan shoes. It's the Jordan 1, right? It's, it's, the, it's the Jordan 1. We got a Me Too in the crowd, amen? Um, and, and I love this shoe right here. It's the original black and red and white colorway. I know a lot about Michael Jordan shoes, right? Probably too much in, in a, like a almost like weird way. Um, but this right here is the black toe Jordan 1. This is the, the first ever Jordan 1 that he wore. Now, it's not the actual one from the 1984 season with the Chicago Bulls. This is actually a retro version. Are we clapping for that? Really? 
what? Well, let me just, give me, let me make my point first, okay? Right? I know a lot about the shoot, all right? I know about some of the stitching in the inside. I know the different colorways. I know that when it came out the original time. Now, when this Michael Jordan shoe came out in 1984, it was Jordan's rookie season. Right? And what happened was so unique about the story, nobody had their own signature shoe yet. So this was a very risky move for Nike, the, the shoe brand company, to sign Michael Jordan, to give him a lot of money to wear their shoe. The NBA got all ruffled up and upset about it. So they said this, if you wear that shoe, Jordan, this shoe right here, we're going to put a ban on it, and we're going to charge you $5,000 a game every time you wear the shoe. Right, And so, so Jordan was like, Nike, what should I do? They said, keep wearing the shoe because the more you wear it, the more sales we get. We'll pay the 5000 every game. Right? <laughs> Not a problem. Right? So he just kept wearing the shoe. The shoe got more and more popular. And Michael Jordan's been retired for 20 years. I'm, I'm still wearing the shoe. I'm still preaching in the shoe. Now, the thing that's interesting about that, why do I even bring that up? Well, because it's one thing to know a whole lot more about the shoe. It's another thing to put it on right? It's something different when you can say, man, that's a whole, that's cool looking at the shoe. That's cool knowing more information at the shoe. But when you put the shoe on and you start to walk in the shoe, it makes it come alive for you a little more, right? Not in a real spiritual way, but in just a way that you get to understand and feel out the shoe in a different way. See, what I'm saying here is this, it's not just something to know about, it's something to experience, right? Like I love Chili's chips and salsa. I could tell y'all all about Chili's chips and salsa, but you know what would be even better? Let's just go get some, all right? You can say like, let me just, I, I get that you're, you know, you're talking about it, but I want to experience it for myself. What's my point? Let, look, it's not just about Jesus. You have to experience Jesus. You have to walk in Jesus. You have to put him on right? It's not just, all right, I got all types of facts and stats about Jesus. I know all about him. Some people tell me that. I know about Jesus. Well, that doesn't really make it, that's doesn't, not a big deal. Uh, the, the devil knows a lot about Jesus. Demons know a lot about Jesus. All types of people know a lot about Jesus. It's, have you experienced Jesus? Have you put him on? That's the question. It's, it's, it, it, I could know a lot about it, but I want to put it on. I, I want to walk in Jesus. And, and the good news is you can. That's, the, that's where the name Walk Church came from. I don't want to just believe in Jesus. Like, okay, yeah, I believed 2,000 years ago it happened. But what does that do for me today? What that does is when you experience the living Christ today, he begins to transform our lives in very real ways. That's why we should put off the old self. It never really got us anywhere. It's not going to take us anywhere. The old self is just eroded. It's just dying. But if you put on Christ, you're on the winning team. It's a new day, and Jesus Christ is alive today. He's not up in heaven somewhere just hoping you do a bunch of good deeds. No, he's, he's down on earth with us, and he's saying, I want to walk in you. I, want, I have vision for you. I have purpose for you. I want to live it out through you. Let me in. Let me in. You need to experience me. Does that make sense? If it does, say, I got it. I got it. Okay, sounds good. He says, assuming that you heard about him, he continues, right? He says, he says, that's not the way you learned Christ, a person. Not about, but the actual person. Then he goes, hold on, dash. Paul's like, well, assuming that you have heard about him. Now, I like the NASB translation a little bit better. The NASB goes into the literal word for word, and that word about's not even in there. I don't even know why it's in there. It's, it's assuming that you have heard him heard his voice, but even still, if you've heard about him through the preaching of his word, he comes alive through his preaching, right? And we were taught in him, right? That this, this, these phrases are big, the fact that we are taught in Christ, positionally in him as the truth is in Jesus. I don't know if you've heard about Jesus or not. I don't want to be on the side that says, I just assume everybody has heard about him. But if you haven't heard about Jesus, you need to get to know him in a real way, and it would be the wisest thing for you to do. Even atheists would come into agreement that Jesus Christ, the historical and figural person, Jesus the Messiah, is the most dominant figure of all of life. Right? There has been no other person that has more songs written and sung about him. There has been no person that has more t-shirts with his name on it. Right? There has been no person that has more hospitals 
built in his name. There has has been no other person that has more people on a weekly basis going to buy and read a book about him. Even in 2019, the best-selling book ever of all time till this day is still the scriptures. Jesus is still alive and intact. He is. He is. And here's some, some of the words that Paul writes in Colossians chapter 1. Verses 15 through 20, we'll throw these up on the screen. Assuming you've heard about Christ, but if you haven't, let me go ahead and talk to you about him, right? He's the image of the invisible God. The, the, the picture that I always think about is this. If, if, if God were to pull out his phone and take a selfie, Jesus' face would pop up, right? Jesus is the image of the invisible God. That's who Jesus is. He's the firstborn of all creation. Now, what that means is this. He doesn't mean that he's the firstborn person of all creation, right? That's, come on, let's, some people try to make that argument. I told you Jesus was, he was born. He's, he's not God. He was born. This firstborn language, those two words together mean he's first at rank, right? He clearly wasn't the firstborn, right? You got a whole left side of your book, right? You know, Jesus came way after Adam, Abraham. He He wasn't the firstborn person, right? He's always been, Jesus has always been, we'll see that, right? He's the first at rank, though, over all creation because Jesus did live as a man and was 100% God at the same time. He's above everything in creation. For by him, all things, everybody say all things. All things were created. That includes you. By Christ and his wisdom and his infinite power and strength and his creativity, he created you. He created you in heaven and on earth. He was creating in heaven and earth, visible and invisible. How about, there's things invisible that Jesus created. I want to ask him what those are. Lord, can you show me what the invisible stuff is? Uh, Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him, and this is where we miss it, and for him. Everything's created for him. The, The reality of this stage was created for Christ. Come on, these shoes, right? They got a Jordan logo, but they're created for Christ. This TV was created for Christ. When you bite into a Snickers bar, you should say, man, thank you, Jesus. You blessed me with this candy bar. Thank you, Christ. Right? All things are created for him. All these good things that we have should radiate praise to God because he gave them to us. Amen? Because all things are created by him. And for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. If you want your marriage to hold together, put Christ in the center of it. That's how it's going to hold on. If If you want your kids to grow up in a way that they understand how they're supposed to live, bring Christ into your home. Bring Christ into your workplace. Not in a weird way that's going to get you fired tomorrow, but in a way where you start loving people the way Jesus loves you. The way you start encouraging people, the way he's encouraged you. And God may open the door for you to invite somebody, not just to church, but to your life. What if you say, hey, before I even take you to church, let me take you to Chipotle. I don't know, somewhere. Like, let me take you to Chili's, right? That's my my heart right now, right? Let let me take you somewhere. Let me take you and, and, and bless you. And let me invite you to my home. And maybe at some point, you can say, hey, would you come with me to church too? Would you, would you come to me to, to the group's night out? Would you come with me? Right? That's how, that's how things hold together because Christ holds it all together. He does. He holds our lives together, doesn't he? I don't know where I would be if it wasn't for Christ holding me together. He does. He's a patient, good God. He holds us together, and he is the head of the body, the church. The verse continues here. He's the head of this church. Amen. Praise the Lord for that. He's the beginning He's the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent, right? He rose from the grave. He is preeminent. He is triumphant. He is the victorious Christ. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. Some people say, well, Jesus wasn't fully God. How? All the fullness of God dwelled in him. Do y'all see this verse? In him, come on, let's read it together. For in him all, stay right there, all. Come on, shout all, louder, all. All the fullness of God. It doesn't say like half the fullness of God or like some of the full. That, w- that wouldn't even make sense with the word fullness. All the fullness of God. Paul wanted to use every word he could to try to describe this type of thinking. All the fullness of God was, was pleased to dwell in this man God named Christ. 
and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. Paul's saying this is who our Savior is, that he's reconciled those who call him Lord and Savior to himself, right? He hasn't reconciled a, a people to a religion. Do y'all hear me? Is this point co- becoming clear? He hasn't, he hasn't reconciled us to a bunch of works and duties and burdens. He's reconciled us to himself. He says, I want you in my family. I want you back with me. I want to reconcile you to me. If you think about this picture of a, a, a vine and a branch, Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branch. Think about that picture for a second. It's not that glamorous, right? But it, it really is stunning. He says, this is how the Christian life is. I'm the vine, Jesus says, right? I, 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 you're the branch. What does that mean? We're just supposed to be attached to him. All we're supposed to do is just hang on to him. And Jesus says, if you hang on long enough, fruit will start popping out of you. And people will be like, man, can I get some of that? I want some of that fruit. How'd you get it? I just stayed close to Jesus. I've just been sticking close to Jesus. All of a sudden, fruit started coming out, right? You know, you plant a tree. Fruit doesn't just happen immediately. You got to come back next week, church. You got to go to, come on, get plugged into this thing. Give Jesus a chance and trust him. Paul says, Ephesians, that's not how you learn Christ. Assuming that you have heard Christ because the truth, the truth is in Christ, Paul says the truth is in Jesus, and, and, and by his blood on the cross, right, Jesus died the death that we're supposed to die because the wages of our sin is death. And maybe you're thinking right now, well, that's probably the person's sin next to me. No, it's yours. It's your sin. It's my sin. The thing that we contribute to our salvation is sin. Not our good works, not our good deeds, not our good thoughts, none, none, none of our goodness will ever be good enough. Right? All of that would just add to our big mess. What we do contribute is our sin, and Jesus takes our sin, right? and he dies on the cross, and he sheds his blood, and through his death, we can then find rescue. Because he died for all of our sin, but he didn't, he didn't stay dead. He, he rose from the grave, like it says in this verse. He's preeminent, and now we put our faith, we look to a risen king who actually invites us to be on his team. And so he gives us a jersey. He says, put on Christ. Take off your old jersey, which says self and sin and death and separated and futile. You got all those things on you. Selfishness, sexual sin, pridefulness, alienated, hard-hearted, darkened in your understanding, children of the wrath of God. All these things are in Ephesians, right? Take all that off and just put on Christ and you have everything. Jesus plus nothing is everything. That's what we're called to do, Walk Church. If you're watching this online, if you're part of FCA, if you're watching this, that's what you got to do. You got to put off the old self, even your old way of thinking. And you put on the new self and you begin walking in him. It's what we're called to do. This is who our God is on earth and in heaven, making peace through the blood of his cross. Now, as we look back at Ephesians 4, the text says, assuming that you heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus. See, the truth is in Jesus. I just want to go ahead and highlight that, that the truth is in Jesus. Jesus, he actually affirms Paul's writings with his own mouth. Maybe you're familiar with this text. It comes from the book of John, Gospel of John, chapter uh, 14, verses 5 and 6. We'll look at this together on the screen. John 14, verses 5, 6, and we'll include 7 as well. See, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he goes, hey, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Because you know me, and you know where I'm going, and you know what I'm doing. I'm going to go to a place in heaven. I'm going to prepare a place for all of y'all because I want all of you guys with me in eternity. And Thomas says in his very futile thinking, right? Thomas says, Lord, we don't know where you're going. What do you mean? We don't, we, don't, we don't get what you're saying. We don't know where you're going. How can we know the way? What a great question, amen? 
How can we know the way? It's like they, they served up an alley-oop. Jesus is like, I'm about to dunk this one, right? <laughs> Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. He says, if you had known me, right? Jesus is getting back to this relationship, right? See, Thomas, you knew about me, but if you really knew me, you would know that I'm the way, the truth, and the life. You would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him, and you have seen him. Jesus says, I'm the image of the invisible God. Since you know me, you know my Father, he says. He's living his life through me, right? And, and, and the Father is is 100% God the Father at the same time. I, this isn't a, a sermon on the Trinity. Our, he, our heads would blow up if I tried to explain it all. I can't really fully explain it all. I just know that God the Father is 100% God the Father, and God the Son, Jesus, is 100% God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit is 100% God the Holy Spirit, and they're all existing perfectly in triune relationship, working together, and desires for us to come and know him. They're all, they, they all are on the same team, in community, in holy tri, triune union. And Jesus says, I'm the way and the truth and the life. Now, some people say, well, isn't that a little closed-minded to believe that? Right? Like, do you really believe that? Yeah. That Jesus is the way to God? He's the truth about God? He's the life of God? Isn't that kind of like, you know, isn't that kind of like exclusive? Right? And I would encourage you today that maybe that's not exclusive. Maybe it's just specific. Right, like, praise God that Jesus is specific. You know, it, when, you put, when you put something in your GPS, right, you want specifics, right? Turn left now. Turn right now. Get to your destination this way. Jesus is like, okay, Thomas, you're looking for the roadmap to this destination. Let me be very specific. It's through me. Like, if you want to get to my house, you got to go through this gate Gated code, you got to put this in, you got to turn left, you got to turn right, then you got to turn right. Now, you could try to go a bunch of different ways, but if you want to get there, you got to go that way. Right. You could try to do a bunch of different things, but I might as well just be specific. This is how you get there. What Jesus is saying here is, look, I'm not trying to be closed-minded or exclude people. I'm giving you the actual description on how to get there. What we should say is, wow, there's a way. We shouldn't say, oh, man, there's all, that's the only way. No, be like, man, there's a way. I'm going to go tell everybody about the way. Yeah. Right? And come on. Yeah. And sometimes we hear something like, you know, redirecting, right? That's the Holy Spirit saying, hey, you diverted from the way. That's the Holy Spirit saying, come on, get this right. Get back on the path. Get back on the track. Go the right way. Go the right way. Come on, he's talking to us here. He's saying, Assuming that you've heard about Christ because the truth is in Christ, it would be wise for you to get to know him, to get to know this Savior, this God named Jesus. If I could just pull up the NASB translation, Ephesians 4.21, the NASB, New American Standard Bible. Uh, I love how it says it, right? It says, if indeed you have heard him, because when we get to know Jesus, we actually get to hear him speak. We really do get to hear his voice. He begins to speak to us, not necessarily in an audible way, but in a way where you start to get impressions from the Spirit of God. You get, begin to, to feel something called conviction. Notice I didn't say condemnation, right? Jesus isn't here to condemn us. We're already condemned. Jesus is here to save us from our condemnation, amen? So he saves us and puts us in right position with God, and then we begin to put on him. We begin to walk in him. Right? And right here it says, then we get to hear him. He begins to speak to us and teach us and grow us. And we get to learn from him. And I want to encourage you this morning, church, if, if you don't really know what I'm talking about, I think that you should start to ask God, God, I want to hear you. That's what you do. Just start to make that your prayer. Lord, I want to hear you. And I don't need to just wake up and hear, hide in get up. Like, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about, God, when I open your Bible, I don't want to just read words. I want to hear you. God, when, when, when I'm going through, when I'm driving to work, I want to talk to you, and I, I, I want you to just start speaking to me and just start bringing things to remembrance. The Holy Spirit will bring things to remembrance, right? Jesus tells us in the Gospel of John chapter 10, 
verse 27, he says, my sheep listen to my voice. I know them and they follow me. Here's how you can tell if you hear his voice or not. Are you following? If you're not following Jesus, it's really because you're not listening to Jesus. And maybe you're not listening to Jesus because your ears are plugged with a whole bunch of other stuff. And you might need to take th- some of that off. Take some of that out. I mean, I've literally been listening to worship music before. And Jesus is like, that's cool, but I'm trying to share something with you. Can you, like, pause that song so you can spend time with me? I'm like, I am spending time with you. I'm listening to worship music. Like, no. No, I, I, I want to download something into your heart right now. Open your word. Talk to me right now. Something about when we spend time with God in prayer, he just starts to just give us ideas. You might spend five minutes in prayer and all of a sudden have an idea. That's God speaking to you. God said, hey, look, I'm putting this person on your heart. You you ever been praying and then someone just comes on your heart out of nowhere? Like, whoa. Because God's been waiting. He's like, man, will you just spend some time with me? Boom, (laughs) put that person on your heart. You know, because it's a moment of undistraction. My sheep, that's who we are. We're the sheep. We listen to my voice, he says. I like listening better than hearing because the, the word hearing means that you perceived a sound with your ear. There was something, there was some type of sound with your ear. The word listen means that you're now paying attention to the sound. The word listen means that you're giving your attention to what is the sound. Right? It's not just, oh, I think I heard something. But no, I actually want to know what it is. It's when you start to listen to his voice and he begins to speak. I was reading a commentary by a guy named J. Vernon McGee, and this word convicted me. I figured I would share it with you as well. He says, here is the contrast with the life of the Gentiles. Again, a Gentile is just a non-believer. It's somebody who believes anything other than what we're talking about, believing in Christ. He says, here's the contrast with the life of the Gentiles. If anyone's not listening to Jesus, then Jesus must not be his savior. The Lord Jesus is the shepherd and his sheep hear his voice. If you haven't heard his voice, then you're not one of his sheep. I love you enough to tell you that today. That if you're not hearing Jesus and spending time with Jesus, you should ask. I'm not saying that this is true for you, but maybe you should ask yourself, am I even part of his flock? Or am I on the outward part of a different flock? A flock that's not going anywhere. Jesus tells us, hey, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me, and I want to call everybody today. I want to call all of you to follow Jesus. Like, your life is too short, and time is too critical, and the mission is too urgent for you to stop, just keep following your own desires and your own ways. Put those things off, let Jesus replace them, and get on the team and get in the game and start making a difference with your job, with your life, with your money, with your car, with your skill, with your gifts, for his glory. It's what you're called to do. The, the moment we understand we were created by God and for God, right? We were, we were created for his purpose, on purpose. Then we'll be able to realize why life even exists. So I call you to that today, is to say, Jesus, I need you to start speaking to me now. I need to start spending time with you, and I want to get to know you, and I want to go for it. I want to give whatever energy and life I have to Christ, and I'll see him in eternity, and he's going to use me now. I want to encourage you with that. That's what Paul is talking about to the Ephesian church here in Ephesians 4. He continues right on to verse 22. He says, so put off your old self which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. He says, put off your old self. Here's why. Because that belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires. He says that these type of feelings are corrupt because they're not part of this new self. I remember when I was in college, I was playing college ball, and we had a strength coach. He would help us with our workouts and give us a different uh, workout to do every day. And here was his one rule. Whenever we stepped in the weight room, we always had to wear something, uh, a clothing article from our team. We couldn't wear, we could definitely not wear another team. We couldn't wear something from our old teams. 
he's saying, hey, you're on this team, and when you're in our weight room, you represent our team. And I remember one day, this guy came in, he's got his high school basketball shirt on, and it was like, time out. What are you wearing? It's like, well, this is my shirt. What do you mean? I said, are you on that team? Uh, I, I, I was. Are you on that team now? No. Then leave and go change your shirt. It was simple, it was simple as that. It was kind of like, it was kind of harsh. But it got the point across, right? See, it, it, it makes things a little weird, right? When you step in with a different shirt, it was weird for him. He was like, oh, man, like, I was on, but I'm not on that team. anymore. So I got to go put on this new self. That's what he's saying. He's saying too many believers, right, are putting on the old self when you're no longer on that team. You're no longer playing for that team. So in the words of my strength coach, Dub, go ahead and put that off and go put on Christ. It right? doesn't mean you have to walk around with a shirt that says Jesus wins unless you want to. We have those. <laughs> um, right? That's part of the kind of the identity, right? Um, but I think it's a spiritual thing. It's, it's an inward thing. It's an inward clothing. It's a spiritual clothing on the inner man that, the in, that even the inner person, you know your inner person, right? Like even practically, you might put on Christ and say like, hey, yeah, it's all about Jesus. But inwardly, you got to put them on. Inwardly, you got to say, Jesus, take the reins and control of my life. I'm putting off the old and I'm, I'm putting on the new. I'm putting off the former life which is corrupt through deceitful desires. The word deceitful just means it's, it's deceiving. How many of you know that? The old desires deceive us. Here's how. The old desires whisper in, in us and say, you should do this. It'll feel really good. And he's saying it's a deceiver because what happens? Does anybody know when you listen to that deceitful voice and you do it, does it feel really good afterwards? Whatever it is, whether it's lying, whether it's cheating, whether it's sexual sin, whether it's slandering, gossiping, pridefulness, like in the moment you're like, okay, yeah, this is good. I'm listening to the deceitful. And then all of a sudden afterwards, everything blows up. You're like, man, I got deceived. It was corrupt the whole time. That's the enemy, right? That's snake. That serpent from the garden is still doing the same tricks. He's just trying to deceive us just enough to miss Christ. And, and we'd be wise to not let them. Proverbs 26 verse 11 says, like a dog that returns to his vomit is a fool who repeats his folly. Does that just make you say, ew? Right? Like, so this dog throws up a bunch of stuff. And then he's like, ooh, look at that. <laughs> hey, let me, let me return to that. That looks good right there. God's saying, that's how you look when you get saved and you jump back into your old self. Does that make sense? Like you once lived in this type of life, this was your life. Then you got saved and you got a new uniform and you got a new calling and you got a new passion. And he's saying that deceitful desire will still try to creep up in you, but make war with that, with the, with the God that's in you, with the word that's in you, with the promises that are to come. Make war with the old things and don't return to the folly. That just looks weird. It actually looks gross. Christians living like that is gross which is why we've lost our witness in a lot of the world today. Christians, they don't live what they're talking about. So I don't want to hear it. Our voice doesn't carry a lot of weight today. You know why? Too much of this. Just too much of that, y'all. So people are like, I'm not really impressed with Jesus because you're his representative. The word represent means to represent. We're representing Jesus, but we're doing that, and it looks weird. But when we start living how Christ has called us to live with him, people will see that and say, man, come on, where's that fruit? Give me a piece of that fruit. I need some real life fruit. I want it. I need it. I need it. I need it. I'll close with this quote from, from Tim Keller. Keller says it like this. He says, he says, holiness has been witnessed in the historical revelation of God in the person of Jesus he says, we read the Bible in order to learn Jesus. Being a Christian is not about trusting a formula, 
but trusting a friend, right? Being a Christian is about saying, you know what, Jesus, I put off my old self. I'm not going to trust my understanding. I'm not going to trust my ways. I'm going to trust my friend. And what a friend we have in Jesus. What a God we have in Jesus. What a Savior we have in Jesus. It would be the right choice today to say, Jesus, I don't know what tomorrow is going to look like, but I know I'm going to trust you with it. I'm going to walk with you right now. I'm going to receive you. I'm going to uh, give us a time to pray right now. We're going to sing a song of response. Um, but today, if you need to make a decision, just make it. Either way, we're going to make a decision. Everybody's going to make a decision today somehow. You're going to say, okay, my decision today is to walk out of here not knowing Jesus. Or your decision is going to say, you know what? I need to get to know him today in a real way, in a real, real way. Because he's less concerned how much or how little you know about him. He just want, he's concerned of whether or not you know him and are walking in him. Let's pray. God, we thank you.